Welcome to Millennials Are Killing Capitalism. This is Jay. In this episode, we speak with Paul Renfro about his book, Stranger Danger, Family Values, Childhood, and the American Carceral State. Paul Renfro is an associate professor of history and affiliate faculty in the Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies program at Florida State University. In addition to Stranger Danger, he's also the co-editor of Growing Up America, Youth and Politics Since 1945, and the author of the forthcoming book, The Life and Death of Ryan White, Hades and Inequality in America, which comes out this fall on UNC Press. Stranger Danger tells the story of how bereaved parents of missing and slain children turn their grief into a mass movement and alongside journalists and policymakers from both major political parties propelled a moral panic, leveraging larger cultural fears concerning familial and national decline. These child safety crusaders warned Americans about a supposedly widespread and worsening child kidnapping threat erroneously claiming that as many as 50,000 American children fell victim to stranger abductions annually. The actual figure was, and remains, between 1 and 300. And kidnappings perpetrated by family members and acquaintances occur far more frequently. We get into all of that and focus intently in this conversation on how Stranger Danger functions from its inception as a moral panic or a sex panic, We also talk about the racial logics animating Stranger Danger, a panic Renfro argues we've never emerged from, one that still animates the realities of mass incarceration today, but one that is often less discussed than other contributing factors to the largest system of carceral control and punishment in the world. This conversation was originally recorded all the way back on September 8th and was slated to be released on Halloween to time up with the ridiculous annual propaganda about strangers lacing children's candy, a reliable myth propelled by the child safety regime. Obviously, that timeline was dramatically derailed by what we viewed as our important focus around Palestine, which has largely taken the form of videos on our YouTube channel. My apologies to Paul Renfro for taking so long to get this excellent conversation edited and released. Even though the conversation certainly has nothing to do with Palestine directly, it's an important one on its own merits. And as I was finalizing the edit for this episode, it was interesting to think in this moment about the demonization of student protesters, the notion that student encampments have somehow been infiltrated by so-called terrorists, outside agitators, or radical professors who are poisoning their minds with radical Islam, teaching them anti-Semitic rhetoric and guerrilla warfare tactics. Certainly, this has many of the hallmarks of a moral panic. And there are many others we discuss in the show, like the panic around schools teaching sex education, the dangers of drag balls, or concerns about transgender kids in sports. It is important to be able to recognize attempts to manufacture panics and to think about how we respond to these multifaceted propaganda efforts. If you want to support our work, the best way to do so is to become a patron of the show. You can do so for as little as a dollar a month at patreon.com slash millennials are killing capitalism. All right. Paul Renfro, welcome to Millennials Are Killing Capitalism. To start, you know, this is a really interesting book. We're talking about your book, Stranger Danger. And, you know, I just want to share with the audience that I have like a personal real interest in this because I was born in 1981. And so... I kind of came into the world right as this panic that you're talking about was really like kicking into high gear and grew up um, in the 80s and 90s, you know, with it basically all around me in all kinds of forms. So we're talking about basically a moral panic, this idea of stranger danger taking hold. Having said that, you know, it's interesting because I also had the childhood in some ways like my parents allowed me a lot of freedom still in the 80s and the 90s to kind of go off and just do stuff with my friends unsupervised, you know, go into town or, you know, I lived out in the country, play in the country unsupervised. And I think about that with my own kids of like, we are as parents more tight gripped on them and kind of, um, I don't I can't think of the right word, but like, you know, there's definitely a sense that you kind of always have to be able to see them or surveil them in some way or, you know, cell phones and all of this stuff. And, you know, and I think about how nowadays, like a lot of the stuff that my parents did that was just still kind of normal, you know, would be seen today as, you know, could be at least by many as being sort of negligent or neglectful. 
And, you know, this book really examines like, where does all that shit come from? Like, where, how do we, how do we move from point A to point B in certain ways as a society? So to start, just say a little bit about Stranger Danger, the book, broadly speaking. And, you know, I'm really interested in kind of for you, like what drew you into wanting to write about this history specifically? Great. Well, yeah, thank you for having me on. And and so what really brought me to this project was actually the the paperboy kidnappings that I talk about in the third chapter. I did my PhD at the University of Iowa. And so when I arrived in Iowa to do my grad work there, I was struck by the ways in which white Iowans, and most Iowans are white, spoke about those cases and then more recent child kidnappings or disappearances. And there was this language of, of innocence and of innocence lost that I found really compelling. And so I started to examine that, those cases, and this larger sort of problem of, or perceived problem of missing children that that emerged really um, in the, the early 1980s, the, the moment in which you were born. Um, you know, really before that period I found in my research, no one spoke about missing children as a kind of social problem, as a, a single sort of phenomenon. When you look back at the the newspaper records, folks would talk about missing children, but they would be referring to two or three kids who went missing rather than this social problem. And so really in 1981 or around there, you have the first uses of missing children as a descriptor uh, for this this larger issue. So, uh, you know, in my dissertation, and, and that became my book, I, I really wanted to kind of excavate that. And what I found was really beginning in the, the late 1970s and into the early 1980s, you had a, a slew of high profile cases, uh, really beginning with Aton Pates in Manhattan in 1979. And you had the Adam Walsh case in 81 in South Florida, the Paperboy kidnappings in 82 and 84, and also the the Atlanta cases, which kind of serve almost as a kind of counter example, right? Because these are young men mostly or, or children of color rather than the the white cases uh, or the cases of white children that that really predominated um, or dominated news coverage and and kind of shaped people's understanding of this problem and and led to that concept of innocence, I think, really sort of driving much of this panic. And you spoke about the moral panic and the, the sex panic kind of animating a lot of this. Um, you know, at the core of, of panics is is that idea of of innocence lost and this nefarious threat or or kind of set of threats that are kind of aligning themselves against all that is pure and all that is just. And so the cases that I'm speaking about here, specifically the cases involving white children, they in the national imagination very much kind of assumed that character and 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 served that purpose or that set of purposes. Um, and so people at this moment were kind of kicking around these really exaggerated statistics concerning stranger abductions. They were saying that 50,000 kids were abducted by strangers in any given year. Of course, that's not true. Um, you know, the, the real figure, it's kind of hard to pin down, but it's somewhere around 100 or, or 300 at the most in the U.S. annually, which, you know, for a country of this size is really not that many, not to diminish the severity of those cases. But what kind of happens in this larger context is folks are talking about family values and the need to to reassert uh, parental authority, kind of institutional authority. And so this or, or this problem or perceived problem kind of enables people to say, well, if we can just kind of return to these imagined values of of a previous era, right, where, um, as you indicated, people kind of imagine that, Kids were allowed to roam free. They they were disciplined, right? They were they're very much kind of reined in, but they they didn't face the sort of dangers that they did supposedly in in the seventies and into the eighties. So the the way I talk about it in the book, there's this kind of shift or perceived shift that that takes place. You know, people begin to think that, and this is tied up with larger sorts of notions about the the country and the family kind of in decline and losing their innocence. So the child is apparently losing its innocence and is facing new threats, right? As if, you know, these threats haven't been around for quite some time. 
and folks are situating those threats outside of the the family home, the kind of romanticized American household uh, that specifically gained this tremendous purchase in the 20th century in the wake of the Second World War. You know, as as the, the kind of Fordist order, as some folks have called it, is is in decline. Um, you know, the the family is perceived to be in decline as well, and the the child at the heart of that family is is in in danger. And so, uh, you know, th- that's that's the way people kind of construct this problem and aim to to address it, right? Um, so that's by situating it again, kind of outside of the family. And fortifying, fortifying the family, and and disciplining uh, those who purport to um, to endanger uh, all that is all that is just and pure. Uh, that's great. I want to touch just a little bit more on something that you just said because this book, as you said, really revolves around a specific kind of moral panic, uh, also around this idea of a sex panic or sexual panic, um, and these are these are fairly common ideas, but. You know, they're so central to the text that I don't want to take for granted that people are, you know, super familiar with them or fully understand what they mean. So can you briefly explain a little bit more about, you know, kind of what these terms mean and how they relate to the subject matter of the book, broadly speaking? Sure, yeah. So moral panic specifically, um, and then later kind of sex panic as a concept, both of them grew out of kind of this cultural studies tradition. And essentially, there's a, a cycle that that scholars sort of believe takes hold in in a moral panic and a sex panic. I mean, sex panic is is quite similar in that it is focused mainly on kind of sexual purity and sexual innocence, and the the nature of the threat under consideration is sexual in nature. Uh, but really, what happens is there is a, a perceived threat, and that threat is amplified. Oftentimes through the news media, with um, the assistance of what some scholars have called moral entrepreneurs, folks who uh, kind of hustlers in a sense, you know, folks who um, will amplify, exaggerate the the extent of of a problem or distort that problem altogether. And um, so this is again sort of these flames are fanned by the news media, by by politicians, and this results in kind of a wildfire, right? A, a kind of a panic that grips the entire nation or or an entire set of the population. And, you know, this oftentimes results in new laws, new practices, right? And eventually, you know, with those, with the institution, the implementation of new laws, new practices, uh, kind of new ways of thinking about a perceived problem, the panic begins to dissipate, right? And order is restored. And oftentimes folks will say, well, aren't we glad that we instituted these new laws? And, and you know, we had this major problem and now that problem has dissipated, even though, you know, it's hard to kind of quantify oftentimes whether that problem even existed or whether it was resolved in any way, right, by by the moral panic or the laws and the practices that kind of resulted from the moral panic. So, um, so the subject of my book kind of sh- bears a lot of these hallmarks, right? So a lot of um, a lot of the the stranger danger co- sort of panic can be um, tied back to this concept of moral panic, or or it bears a lot of those features. Um, but I argue that the that panic never really died because we never really kind of metabolized it. We never really absorbed, um, you know, the, the we never really kind of absorbed the lessons of of, of that. That moment, or or came to grips with the fact that yes, the, this is totally a myth, right? This is not uh, a legitimate uh, kind of pervasive threat facing American children, and in many ways, it kind of distorts, um, you know, skews our understanding of the threats that that face children, because you know the world is a, a dangerous place in many ways, and it's uh, but it's dangerous for less kind of uh, in less sensational ways. So, you know, children in America are are really vulnerable to to abuse, but it's not by strangers, right? It's not by people they don't know. It's by people they they do know, whether it's within the family or uh, in the kind of trusted institution, whether it's the church or the synagogue or the temple or the school, right? They're also uniquely vulnerable to, to kind of hunger and, and poverty and, and educational inequality and all these different kind of structural material problems that 
don't necessarily uh, find their way onto TV screens necessarily, right? Um, so these are the sorts of things, uh, these kind of more sensational problems. And, and I think we can, in this late 20th century moment, you see so many of these, right, where people are talking about teen pregnancy, even though teen pregnancy in the early 90s, uh, the rates were were much lower than they were in the 1950s. All these different panics about gangs and and all these different problems that are facing children, right, uh, or supposedly facing children, when when in fact they aren't necessarily the the major dangers. But uh, so there's a lot of kind of obfuscation going on here, and panics sort of preclude a really sort of logical pr- approach to these sorts of issues, right? Or the problems that that really face children, and they they privilege kind of the visceral. The emotional over the kind of cold and calculated and and um, you know smarter approach to to the problems that face American children. So panics kind of serve, I guess, these different functions, right? But you know, I think we could say that that panic never died, and we're maybe living in the afterlives of it, or, or we're still very much kind of in the throes of of that panic that originated in in the late seventies. Yeah, it's just kind of accepted, right? As like kind of. Uh... You know, it's hegemonic, basically, right? It, it, right. It's, it's common sense. Yeah, it's common sense, right? And so, you know, as you just alluded to, like, you know, what we're really talking about here is the idea specifically that strangers are dangerous and they are likely to kidnap and abuse children, right? And this is still a very prevalent, you know, myth. It's still some, you know, people still tell their kids, don't talk to strangers, things like that. That was obviously a huge, huge thing, <laughs> a big hit in the 80s, right? And, you know, Josh, unfortunately, is not here today. I'd be interested to hear kind of his reflections on it, you know, growing up more in the two thousand early 2000s. But I certainly remember, you know, the prevalence of this in school. My parents were also school teachers. Right. And so, like, it was really, it, you know, I would talk to them the other day about it and they talked about all the kind of changes and discussions that were going on as teachers at the time, too. And you've already broken down kind of how far off this reality is from the the kind of statistics that were levied by people who are promoters of this panic, the idea of 50,000 children when it's really more like probably 100 to 300. So I won't ask about that again, but I do want to sort of take that a step further and note how, you know, there's, there's one of the things you point out in the book is that a lot of things are kind of conflated here, right? Like, mm-hmm. so there's... Um, you know, there's stranger child abduction, which is often conflated with child molestation, even though they're really largely separate, occasionally overlapping issues. But that, you know, these kinds of conflations obscure the reality and are certainly useful for certain types of culture wars, but they don't actually help us deal with like the problem of child abuse or molestation necessarily. Yeah, so I talked about the the missing children sort of term and the way it really erupted uh, or kind of burst onto the scene in the in the early '80s and became this kind of catch all term. Um, so within missing children, as kind of an umbrella category, you have uh, runaways, you have so called thrown away children, you have. Parental kidnappings, familial kidnappings, stranger kidnappings, and there are probably some others that I'm missing. But you know the the small subcategory within that larger category is uh, stranger abductions, right? So they're very small. They're really difficult, kind of in these federal studies that were commissioned in the 80s and, and uh, conducted kind of in the years following. They found that you know these are really kind of hard to even kind of study because there are just so few of them. And when compared to the the actual actually pretty significant number of of uh, familial kidnappings and and runaway cases, you know it's it, it's totally dwarfed by those. But missing children as this sort of vague abstract term, it conjures that smallest category, right? It it conjures stranger danger victims because they are the cases that everybody knows. They are the cases that dominate news coverage and dominate kind of political rhetoric and ultimately become the the namesakes that that is the the names of victims they become the namesakes in memorial laws that have these really far reaching consequences 
So there's that obfuscation there, right? There's that 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 obscuring that takes place with missing children as as this category. Um, and it's understandable because, you know, these are, and I know one of your questions kind of gets at this, these are really sort of compelling cases. They are terrifying cases in many ways, and they feature children that American culture has long sort of viewed as as innocent and as kind of special, right, in ways that the Atlanta cases weren't, right, because these this is uh, several dozen African American kids uh, and and young men who go missing and who don't kind of carry the same uh, characteristics or don't have the same markers, right? That the more kind of celebrated children do, and they are not the the ones that that folks remember. They are not the ones whose names find their way onto to federal legislation or in federal legislation. Um, so that's that's some of the work that that missing children does, right? So as as a term, especially given its kind of history or its its lack of a history, it it kind of serves this purpose to kind of uh, signal right this larger sort of social problem. And as I noted, it it can be a catch all not only for kind of the stranger danger problem, which again is so distorted and and so exaggerated, but for all these different concerns, you know, about pornography. Pornography is a huge concern in the 1980s, and I talk a bit about it in the book. Teen pregnancy, you know, drug use, obviously the war on drugs, Reagan's war on drugs is very much raging at this moment. So, you know, all of these different problems that that folks very kind of ahistorically uh, believe to be um, new or or newly kind of uh, amplified, um, they can kind of use missing children or, or stranger danger or child safety uh, for for all of these different concerns. Yeah, and we talked about it a little bit later, but I probably should we probably should touch on it here too. Is just also obviously the you know the homophobic uh, elements of this, and then like the conflation as well of of gay people and pedophiles as like, you know, the same sort of thing or or that behind every gay person is a pedophile or whatever it is. It's interesting in the book because you kind of show how it's not directly stated all of the time, but becomes kind of implied. And maybe we can, I'll, I'll wrap in another question here, because one of the things you talk about is the role of these photogenic, intelligenic children you know, and how it began, this panic begins around boys. Uh, it doesn't, you know, later on, girls and young women become a part of it in the 90s. But in the 80s, it's all about these young boys. And there's a relationship between these cases to a kind of new burgeoning national mm-hmm. news cycle, you know, things like the the beginning of, you know, CNN and cable news. And, you know, the images and the representations of these children and how they're kind of used and, you know, you, you talk about this in terms of this other, I guess it's a fear, right, that's animating this as well, that does come out in certain interviews and in certain discussions and sometimes fairly prominently by prominent figures of this kind of panic again about sort of, you know, gay liberation, sexual liberation, you know, as well. Yeah. So, you know, this wasn't... You know, Scholars of specifically kind of conservatism and, and late 20th century U.S. politics have been arguing for for several decades about this concept of backlash. And so I I don't want to suggest that it was a backlash to, to gay liberation or women's liberation or the African-American freedom struggle because resistance to, to all of those different struggles – existed throughout you know the the kind of classical phase of each of them so to suggest that all of a sudden you know there there was a backlash to it uh, or to to all these different movements is is kind of a historical but you know you do see the emergence of a kind of particular politics of the family and of of child protection that begins to congeal in the 1970s and into the 1980s. And a lot of the developments that I talk about in the book grow out of some of what Anita Bryant was was talking about in the 1970s, this kind of very clear anti-gay campaign, this effort to roll back protections uh, for queer people in, in various municipalities, uh, beginning in, in Miami-Dade County. 
And that the rhetoric at the the core of her campaign, the the Save Our Children campaign, uh, was very similar to what you heard and and saw in the 1980s in the the panic that I'm talking about, but also what you hear today concerning grooming and uh, yes, this sometimes explicitly stated, sometimes implied idea that that queer folk are sexually deviant and all of their sort of performance of gender or sexuality serves as a kind of mask for their desire to to groom children and, and abuse children, right? So that's very clear in in Bryant's rhetoric. You know, she oftentimes employs this idea that, you know, uh, gay folks can't reproduce and so they must recruit. So this language of recruitment is uh, is very, very important in, in her work. And I think it's almost always implied in all of these cases and responses to the cases that I write about in Stranger Danger. You know, in the Aton Pates case, for instance, you know, this was a, a very photogenic child. His father was a professional photographer. And so when he went missing, and this is in the the cultural capital, the the financial capital, some would say the queer capital of the United States. And obviously, uh, this is in New York City. This is a city with, you know, kind of worldwide import. So because news media is so kind of centered in that area, you know, this case becomes enormous, right? And, and it becomes reflective of um, and representative of these these larger problems that are facing or supposedly facing the country, the family, children, uh, but also New York, right? So New York is in the the throes of a financial crisis. Uh, there's a lot of fear concerning crime uh, and disorder. And so this case comes to symbolize all of that. And, you know, because New York has obviously a huge uh, gay population and, and has, you know, served as a sort of beacon for for queer folks, um, you know, as George Chauncey and others have, have illustrated for for many, many years, that becomes a suspicion in in the minds of investigators, right? And I kind of connect that to to these photographs and and to this notion that yes, of course, folks would want to exploit this sort of innocence, and and these folks that they're talking about here are always queer or or deviant in some way or somehow connected to you know communities that are that are marginalized. So that happens in the Aton Pates case. It happens. Um, there's kind of some of that implied in the Adam Walsh case. In the Atlanta case, that's always sort of front and center, right? There's this idea that um, there's a, a kind of and the the language there is interesting because it's it's not a predator kind of um, exploiting uh, the the young men and, and boys in Atlanta. It's uh, there they are kind of to blame for their own sort of plight. Um, and of course, this none of this is necessarily confirmed. There there's a lot of speculation about. Uh, sex rings and and that sort of thing within uh, the context of the Atlanta cases, but you know, as far as my research shows, it or has kind of revealed, there's there's no kind of clear, um, you know, the, no no real kind of ring is impl- implicated in in any of this or or anything like that. So, but within the Atlanta case, it's always or the cases, it's always these young men and boys are participating kind of willingly. In their own exploitation, or in in these sex rings, in these sorts of um, you know un, these undercurrents or these these dark sort of corners of of society, um, and this is very clear in in Iowa as well with the the Johnny Gosh and the Eugene Martin cases, uh, in which Noreen Gosh, who is Johnny Gosh's mother, gets up in front of Congress and says, you know, this is. This is the, all the pedophiles doing, and this is kind of a new problem. You know, she she makes this claim about polio being a huge problem when she was little, and now pedophilia is the problem, right? Um, so there's this understanding of pedophilia as kind of novel, and she she ties this directly to gay liberation and um, and this kind of fear of of gay liberation. And so the the implication, not so subtle, is that her son was recruited into this sex ring and the same thing happened to Eugene Martin. 
And this happens again and again and again. And that's not to say that, you know, folks are not, that these children were not sexually abused or some of them weren't, right? So the Jacob Wetterling case, it's a clear kind of example of, of sexual abuse by a stranger. And his name becomes uh, the the foundation for the Jacob Wetterling Crimes Against Children and Violent Offender Registration Act, I think. I might be wrong on that, but that's part of the, the Clinton crime bill, right? So that that whole, there's this clear sort of thread tying, I think, the Anita Bryant rhetoric and, and activism, which again, kind of builds on this understanding of, of queer folks as, as deviant, as operating in the shadows, as constantly seeking to, to recruit, add to their ranks, and they're going to do this. They're going to replenish their ranks by recruiting children. So there's a connection to, to Anita, Anita Bryant there and then to the, the cases that I write about in the book and to the, the kind of sex offense registry that, that emerges with, uh, with Jacob Wetterling and, um, and the, the crime bill. And I think it's not difficult to see how this shapes contemporary rhetoric concerning QAnon and um, and grooming and recruitment. So I think that that thread and that, that there's one reason why I say the panic has never really subsided, right? It, I mean, it, it does ebb and flow, but this concern about kind of trafficking, I think, uh, which is relatively new or is kind of a new expression, I think, of these older fears and anxieties, um, that can't be, you know, that, that is an antecedent to, to QAnon. So there is always this fear um, kind of bubbling under the surface or sometimes exploding, right, and, and gripping American society as, as we see today. Yeah. It's all kind of very clearly homophobic in nature or there, sometimes it's more explicit, but there is this kind of sense that sexual minorities are somehow coming for your children. Yeah, and definitely resonant too with all of the kind of anti-trans, anti-transgender uh, rhetoric that's going on right now, and confrontations of you know drag balls and things like that. You know, um, it's 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 really you know that that was one of the things I appreciated about this book is it really kind of gives a much rather than looking at that as like out of history as like what's going on now, like seeing like no like there's a very long thread here that this is connected to the the one piece that I had you know I kind of already asked this specific question so I won't ask it again but there was a, a part of this question I did want to ask you about which is there's also this interesting part in it about runaways you know mm-hmm. and and about also like that at a certain point there was kind of an understanding to some degree in certain circles, right, that mm-hmm. um, the family was a dangerous and repressive place for some people and that teenagers, later teens, escaping that might not always be a bad thing and they certainly shouldn't be sort of criminalized for mm-hmm. that. And this also in some ways dovetails with, you know, kind of gay liberation because there is it is kind of happening in a period of um you know like kind of what did what would you call it the you know i mean in the late 60s early 70s there there's kind of a um like sexual liberation kind of to to some degree and recognizing that for queer folks that uh the family can be a uniquely repressive place the patriarchal family right mm-hmm. and so you know this I think we'll get into like kind of a the the policy shifts over this a little time, but there is a, a point at which which Reagan kind of does respond to later on, and we will have mm-hmm. a question about that. But in the mid seventies, there's some there's some things going on here that basically allows to, for a little more freedom for a brief period of time for, I guess, elder teens in terms of sort of deciding their own fate or destiny. Is that correct? Totally. Yeah. So there is a moment of youth liberation that I think is tied to the, the you know, sort of emancipatory spirit of, of the 60s and 70s. And there's a, a general sense, I think, with the war in Vietnam, with um, more and more young, the student movement, right? Um, you know, more and more people kind of recognize that the children, young people should, you know, have agency, right? And so they they should have access to certain freedoms, the the right to vote, right, that gets 
reduced, uh, the, the age gets reduced in, in the 1970s and the early 70s. Uh, there's a slew of, of court cases um, that sort of affirmed certain rights for, uh, you know, I'm thinking of Tinker v. Des Moines, for instance, right? A- affirming the the First Amendment rights of, of young people, right? The, their right to protest the war in Vietnam, et cetera. So there are these different developments that kind of demonstrate that, that children, young people are asserting themselves. And there is a kind of, I guess, a growing awareness, you might say, that that young people are, are citizens or, or some of them are citizens and they need to um, have rights uh, in, in ways that, that adults do. So, you know, so that's that's tied up with this kind of um, this 60s moment, this 70s moment. And there is uh, a response to that. Right. And I should say also, you know, a direct response that, that Reagan has, and we can talk about this a bit later, is to this really pivotal piece of legislation, the Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Act of 1974, which recognizes, as you said, that runaways occasionally are fleeing really abusive, dreadful situations. And yeah, there is, I don't even think I'll talk about it in the book, but you know, it's quite clear that um, queer folks, queer young people are are kind of disproportionately represented today, and it, it stands to reason then among runaways and and uh, you know unhoused young people because they're often fleeing abusive family situations, um, and the heteropatriarchal family is uh, repressive, right? And so they are they're seeking to flee that situation. Oftentimes, they're thrown out of their homes. So I think. That may not have been kind of animating the the legislation, but it's it's very clearly kind of impacting that population in in certain ways. But yes, the JJDP Act uh, essentially says, yeah, we're not going to criminalize runaways. We're going to uh, provide shelter, and and there is this acknowledgement that yes, young people have agency. You know, at a certain age, they can flee these situations, right? So let's go to Atlanta, you know, um, yeah, yeah. because it, it's it this is an important chapter and um it's interesting like again growing up in this period this is something that I never heard about at the time which speaks to the sort of what you talk about in terms of how it's received and reported and shared. On I hadn't heard about level, it either, yeah. You know. Yeah. I did hear about, you know, it is season 2 of Mindhunter which is uh <laughs> Interesting. I mean, it does get to some of the pieces that you talk about about this. Of course, it's told through the perspective of uh, FBI agents and, yeah. um, you know, criminal profilers. So, right. It's a very specific. It's pretty accurate, though. I mean, yeah. Yeah. It, yeah that perspective is is problematic. Right. The, but it does kind of spotlight uh, many of the mothers. Right. And and I think it does a good job of that and, and gets to some of the sort of class and, and racial dynamics at play yeah yeah and it talks about you know it shows some of these things that you kind of you know have discussed in terms of you know presenting the boys as you know street hustlers who may be uh, engaging in you know kind of uh sex work on you know to make money and that kind of stuff as you know and and kind of the whole thing is sort of you know laden with that basis which is really interesting considering that that's you know that's never even brought up as an idea in relation to the white children that you know right. this, this occurs with right but i want to read a, a quote from this chapter so quote um incidences of missing white boys generally prompted discussions of innocence lost of the white family buffeted by sinister exogenists and of an american childhood ideal under serious threat Conversely, the discourse surrounding the Atlanta saga denied the young victims the very status of childhood, portraying the missing and slain not as innocents, but as sexually depraved street hustlers consumed, uh, street hustlers is in quotes, um, consumed by the decrepit neighborhoods in which they dwelled. Put simply, the black youth snatched and slain in Atlanta did not possess the traits that made Pates, Walsh, Gosh, and Martin all American. All Americans also in quotes, and the names and faces of Patrick Baltazar, Eric Terrell, and Duran Glass or Darren Glass did not populate images of endangered childhood or drive the child safety campaign, end quote. So 
just talk a little bit more about some of the resonances you see between, you know, there's certain areas where this overlaps uh, between the slain black children in Atlanta and other instances uh, where it's, you know, white, white boys predominantly, um, particularly around the ideas of family heteronormativity and homosexuals as depraved predators. But also there's some very clear differences um, along, as you already sort of alluded to, class and racial lines between these missing children and their white counterparts that produce different responses. Right. Yeah. So thanks for sharing that. And in Atlanta, there is, and this is kind of a dynamic that I I didn't talk about or haven't mentioned yet, but in this larger missing children movement or child safety campaign, there is this skepticism toward the state and the government. And that's something that dovetails quite neatly with a lot of Reagan's rhetoric, even though Reagan is not diminishing the size of the federal government. He's actually expanding it, but his rhetoric is essentially implying, not not even implying, but you know, kind of very explicitly stating, I am going to shrink the state. The government is bad, but trust me, you know, I'm I'm the president. Um, I am going to expand, you know, uh, defense spending and and incarcerate more more black folks. But, you know, just believe me. So there's skepticism there, right? There, uh, in the the Walsh case, uh, John Walsh is very, very critical of of the police, of of federal law enforcement. So police in in Hollywood, Florida, and also federal law enforcement, and just the government bureaucracy in general. And you see that also in the Walsh case, less so in the, in the Gosh case. So Noreen Gosh is is very, very critical of of investigators and. You see that in Atlanta as well, because there isn't a response at all uh, for for a year or so to what's quite clearly a string of of uh, murders, abductions and murders in Atlanta of children, mostly actually almost exclusively boys. I think there's one one girl, um, and the the mo in each of these cases is is quite similar, right? The you know they're they're kind of snatched off the streets, um, and and they are found dead in this, usually in the woods or sometimes in the woods in the Atlanta area. I try not to get into you know the kind of who done it dynamics because that's less interesting to me. But you know there, some folks say that these were perpetrated by many many different people, or um, you know there's no way that Wayne Williams could have committed all of them. I find that compelling, but kind of for my purposes. This is all kind of one discrete sort of problem, and and one discrete sort of phenomenon. So um, and and is kind of understood as such in the national media. But going back to this question of government skepticism or skepticism of government that I think unites these two different forces, because again, you have kind of the child safety campaign, which is white and very much focused on white innocence, white childhood innocence. And the stop movement, committee to stop children's murders. So the the stop movement, the committee to stop children's murders in Atlanta, it is also very skeptical of of government, but it's skeptical of government on on different grounds or in different ways. And I would say that their grievances are far more legitimate because the state, the police are not intervening, and it's quite clear why they're not intervening, or, or they are very much uh, reticent to to call this a string of of murders or a serial sort of case or or set of cases, because Atlanta has this great resonance in in the history of the the so-called New South, and it is seeking to become this kind of international city in the late. 20th century. And this is all kind of undertaken by, or this is a project mostly led by black folks. Uh, you know, Mayor Maynard Jackson, the the police chief uh, is is also African American, and the the public safety commissioner, Lee Brown, who eventually becomes the the mayor of Houston, my hometown, they they're all very clearly kind of trying to to mitigate the severity of these cases. Or they're unwilling to to connect them, at least initially. And when they do respond and do kind of declare that this is there's a, a pattern here, uh, their response is a very it resonates with this larger family values 
rhetoric. They they basically are trying to articulate and promote kind of a black family values, right? And that connects to what a lot of white liberals are saying in that moment and in decades prior about the uh, the matriarchy, right? The the kind of pathology of the black family, you know, Daniel Patrick Moynihan and Again, that's not unlike the ways in which children in Atlanta, the victims, were being blamed in some ways for their own misfortune. The family here and and the the idea that the family is kind of depraved uh, or somehow you know inept that's being sort of identified as the problem here, not uh, you know not racism or or poverty or you know these kind of structural conditions that that make these children in Atlanta particularly vulnerable, right? So so there's a kernel of truth to this idea that they are kind of, they're out running errands, right? And and so the, the street hustlers sort of idea is obviously it's seeking to kind of criminalize these black youth, but they are trying to make ends meet oftentimes, right? Because they are so poor. And so they will run to the, the grocery store and, and help folks put groceries in their, uh, in their cars or, or whatever. And that makes them particularly susceptible to to, to being snatched and, and slain. And I think that's that's the those are the scenarios in which they're kidnapped, right? Usually, but that mutates in in news media coverage and kind of in political rhetoric into this very accusatory sort of labeling of of these children as as street hustlers. You know, there's um, some really ugly language. Street gruntions, I think, is one, and the. The solution or proposed solution is a reassertion of family values. And there's this kind of, I think, indicative of this kind of black liberalism and also this black, in a sense, kind of a black religious conservatism that that is defining Atlanta and defines a lot of um, African-American communities in this moment. And you know, Daniel Wiggins has, has written a dissertation about this. It's soon going to be a book, uh, basically a, a, the history of black excellence and and the, the racial politics and the class politics of black excellence as a concept. And I think there's a lot of that in Atlanta. And she has a chapter about, at least in the dissertation, there was a, a chapter about the Atlanta abductions and murders. So there's a, a similarity there. But again, I think the skepticism that a lot of black folks had, especially poor black folks had of the the, the leadership and the the kind of political establishment and business establishment there was was a lot more justified, right? So there is a class dynamic, and they hit the nail on the head. They're always saying, "Well, you know, they don't really care about us, right? They they are the rich folks, they're elite folks. They're going to look out for elite white folks, and they're looking out for Atlanta, not for us." Also, this is a moment of kind of a, a white power resurgence, right? So, you know, in the late 70s and into the 80s, the Klan is on the rise. The Klan has, has had this really strong foothold in Atlanta for quite some time, right? I mean, just right outside of Atlanta at Stone Mountain, you had the birth of the second Klan, essentially, in the early 20th century. And there's long been a Klan, a Klan presence in the the police force there and, and uh, among kind of uh, sheriff's offices in in that area. So, you know, I, I got when I uh, submitted this book to another press, uh, I got a lot of pushback for that for saying, you know, OK, this because a lot of these poor black folks are saying this is genocide or, they, you know, they're trying to kill black kids. And, and so when reviewers said, no, that's ridiculous. You know, why would they think that? But it's totally understandable why why you would think that. Right. They, all these kids are getting snatched and killed. Uh, this is a moment again of of kind of uh, folks are very fearful of Reagan too. They view Reagan almost as if, uh, almost like people viewed. And not, I'm not saying this is unjustified, but almost like the ways in which people viewed Trump in in 15 and 16. Right? They're saying that he's in cahoots with white power elements, and this is basically a, a kind of a white power revolution or a redemption. Right? So I think coming on the heels of the African American freedom struggle, you know, I don't think it's that unreasonable to to make those sorts of claims, especially when there's no real push to sort of resolve these cases and the the state response is so unsatisfactory for for the folks who were most affected by these cases. So there's yeah, those are, hopefully I answered your question. They're kind of those are the resonances that I that I see between them, but also uh, there's tremendous kind of divergence between those as well. Yeah, absolutely. 
And I think that Atlanta aspect is really interesting, even, you know, today with discussions around Cop City and there's a lot of good mm. critiques coming out from folks, you know, black folks involved in that movement of the the kind of um, the misleadership class, as they would call them in, in Atlanta and the appeals to capital and to presenting Atlanta as um, a black Mecca or presenting it as this, you know, really safe, well off area for black folks and that this narrative of you know dozens of black children being kidnapped there you know is not something that jives with that that narrative right and so trying to wrestle through for those leaders you know how do we like first sort of downplaying ignoring pretending like it's not kind of a problem but then also when you do step into it you know pathologizing or making it about basically bad parents, right? Or bad, you know, bad family mm-hmm. dynamics and how this kind of fits. And so, um, and then I think, you know, as you said, like on the national level, right, because of racism in society and media, right, it just doesn't have the same cachet. And also, you know, the children themselves, of course, pathologized uh, as, which is very interesting. I mean, because also like part of the panic for white folks in all of this is about we want our children to be able to go outside and to be away from the family and to be safe Mm -hmm. right and then you're basically saying well these are black children that are away from their family and are outside and are (laughs) you know and so yeah you know it is interesting that way um so and the in the iowa cases these were paper boys who were out running uh or, or on their roots right when they got snatched so they're not ever labeled as as street hustlers or, you know, kind of trying to, I mean, obviously they were middle class and so they weren't necessarily, I mean, I guess Martin was probably lower middle class, but they're not demonized and kind of labeled in the same way, right? And, right. and this is not kind of indicative of white pathology, right? There is a crisis or perceived crisis in the white family, but it's exogenous threats. It's not endogenous. It's not Oh, well, the family is just, you know, uh, culturally bankrupt, right? And so we need to reassert these traditional family values. And I mean, obviously, that that rhetoric does sort of uh, appear, but white families are not implicated in the same way that the black family is. There's a fear that the, the white family will eventually or without due diligence kind of fall by the wayside and and kind of mimic the the black family, which is perceived to be, you know, you know, culturally bankrupt, uh, just kind of in a state of disrepair, but still the white family is is kind of understood to be this bulwark against all these different forces. And if you can just kind of fortify it enough, then everything will be okay, right? Because the nation's fate and the, the family's fate are interconnected. Yeah. And I mean, it's interesting because like one of the things that popped into my head as I read this book, and we'll get to, I want to ask about the Iowa one, but is the like white genocide, like the the sort of the 14 words like this, this idea, like we must, you know, our children, right. Are our nation's future as white people. Right. Basically. And, and that sort of logic really, not that it ever wasn't there, but it's, it's very much kind of animating some of the concerns here, at least that's me psychoanalyzing it. Right. That's the way <laughs> that I see yeah. it. So, so as you mentioned, you write about this panic in the Midwest in relation to the disappearances of a couple of paper boys you um you pull some quotes. I think these are from I, I didn't source them well, but I think they were from, you know, parents or people talking, also probably editors like talking about this in newspapers. But one of the quotes says, if you're not safe in West Des Moines, you're not safe anywhere. And another one says paper boys symbolize the all American boy. And so these are things that people are saying at the time about these cases and what they mean um, in Iowa. So if you could just say a little bit more about kind of the Midwestern dimension of this panic, because it starts out, you know, initially these first cases, as we kind of talked about, like sort of like New York and, you know, maybe um, seems kind of like a coastal, you know, concern or something a little bit. And then you have Atlanta, obviously, which doesn't really fit neatly into uh, the kind of stranger danger you know, national conversation as well because of the racialized responses around black children. 
So what do you see as some of the interesting and important elements of this uh, as you move in kind of the Midwestern aspects of it, which, as you mentioned in the beginning, is kind of where you started on this journey? Totally, yeah. Yeah, so I was very interested in interrogating kind of the notion of white innocence and how it is attached to region. So for for the Midwest, there's almost this unwillingness to, uh, among some folks, to kind of grapple with the fact that it is, especially a state like Iowa, it's incredibly white. And, you know, it's not by accident, right? Um, <laughs> this is kind of forged through, uh, you know, dispossession and sundown towns and, and uh, you know, these restrictive sort of measures. And I was just in Iowa doing a bike ride up there. And it, it's just, it always strikes me how, how white that state is. And so when these paper boys went missing. First, Johnny Gosh went missing in 1982, and then Eugene Martin went missing in 1984. Um, there is this idea that what was a, a coastal concern or a large kind of urban concern, and these are all, in my analysis, kind of code words, right? Um, you know, and, and oftentimes it's not implicit. There's, um, I think, James Gannon, who is the he was kind of trying to cover his own ass because these are both Des Moines Register paper boys. He's the editor of the Register, and he writes this really searing uh, editorial that is talking about, um, you know, the the urban sorts of fears, right? That um, or the urban threats that are now supposedly confronting this peaceful what was imagined as a sort of peaceful white landscape, right? This, this white Midwestern innocent uh, site that is, you know, supposed to be sacred, right? And it is now because of these paperboy cases supposedly kind of under threat. Um, so I want to read that, that quote from Gannon. So Gannon kind of juxtaposes the white, heartland with these urban environments, which obviously are kind of coded black and brown and perhaps queer. But he urged within this editorial, he urged fellow Des Moiners, his, his you know, people in Des Moines and and I think the, the Midwest more broadly, he urged them not to, quote, cede the streets to the shadowy threat of terror and, you know, not let Des Moines and Iowa um, become like, and he explicitly cites Detroit or Newark or Chicago, right? So two of these are, are Midwestern sites, but they are kind of positioned as non-Midwestern or kind of distinct from the Midwest as it's imagined by people like Gannon. So this, these two cases, and again, it's just two cases, they assume this tremendous symbolic value, right? And because these paper boys were paper boys, right? Because, and that's understood to be, uh, I think it's uh, Peter Jennings who talks about how this is part of the American dream. Being a paper boy is part of the American dream. He says that on a national news broadcast and other folks use that terminology, all American, all American boy, right? And, you know, so they're not saying white, but they're <laughs> they're really saying white. And, and so- I think there's a, a clear sort of way in which the white Midwest, th those things can't be uncoupled. And you just add on the the kind of paperboy dimension and and these other sorts of markers or, or characteristics, they clearly kind of suggest that this is this is a racialized and and regionally specific kind of concern within the Midwest. Obviously, people like Noreen Gosh are connecting this to a broader national threat or perceived threat. So she works with John Walsh, for instance. She She's connected to this larger national movement, this child safety campaign. But her campaign and the rhetoric of people like James Gannon and others, they're very much kind of situating their, their concerns within the Midwest. And they're saying, we need to fortify the white family. We need to fortify our communities. You know, there is something sinister that is threatening us. It's it's exogenous. It's dark, right? There's a there's kind of clear 
a racial language there. So I found that case or these cases to be really compelling for those reasons. And people still, you know, I cite some of these interviews that have been conducted in the years since. And, you know, I mean, 30 years, now 40 years since the first case. And the idea is still very much present. The, the idea that this kind of shattered something, it, it, it ruined uh, what once was, you know, so pure. And that has, yeah, I think that has resonance in the political sphere. I think Iowa's, you know, rightward drift in the past several years can be tied to that notion of, of white innocence and white innocence lost. And this kind of agrarian pastoral ideal being corrupted somehow and in seeking to sort of fortify and I guess to kind of recapture that, I should say, and maybe for those who aren't familiar with Iowa politics, it went blue for every presidential candidate from since 1984 through 2016, uh, except for uh, George W. Bush in 2004. So a pretty reliably blue state, and now it is incredibly red. And so that that shift has happened. They loved Obama there. They, they loved Obama there. But that shift has happened quite quickly. And I think that can't be understood without understanding how uh, how whiteness operates in, in that space and how kind of notions of, of regional innocence, racial innocence operate as well. And those are forces that, that totally drive the way people are responding to and understanding the paperboy kidnappings. And I think that might help us understand exactly what's going on there politically. Uh, a lot of anti-trans stuff going on there, anti-gay stuff as well. Uh, Kim Reynolds is the the governor who's made her kind of name, cut her teeth, um, you know, opposing, you know, men and women's sports, quote unquote, right? And opposing that and seeking to, to fortify, uh, white girlhood, essentially. And there's a, a really telling picture of her signing that legislation into law. She's surrounded by by white girls, right? Uh, and that that is just the, the picture of, of innocence. And um, I think that has clear sort of connections to to the the panic that that we're talking about here that, that took place in the 80s. Yeah, absolutely. So Another interesting aspect, you don't spend a lot of time on this, but you do certainly highlight it in the book, is thinking about all of the ways that this panic kind of infused itself into mainstream culture, Hollywood movies, sitcoms, obviously this kind of generic, you know, after school network movie special kind of industry. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, for instance, you know, I'm thinking about things like uh, milk carton campaigns, you write, mm -hmm. quote, Airing in 1985, the year in which the milk carton program first attained serious national exposure, an episode of the NBC sitcom Punky Brewster used a missing child on a milk carton to drive its main storyline. By the early 90s, the milk carton kid had appeared in a variety of popular texts, the 1987 teen vampire film The Lost Boys, the 1988 Tom Hanks vehicle Big, the 1989 movie Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, and a 1993 episode of The Simpsons, and Caroline Cooney's young adult novel The Face on the Milk Carton, published in 1990. And so I read or watched every single thing that is cited here. I mean, it, it which just shows, I mean, that's when I grew up and that's the stuff that was you know, age appropriate for me at the time, basically. Um, but, and, and I, you know, I also, there's like, you know, some resonance here with like Home Alone too. Also there's, I, I'm remembering there's a stranger danger moment in Kindergarten Cop, even though that's a movie actually about familial kidnapping, which is one yeah. of you. So I'm interested in the interplay, uh, you know, of this whole panic between, you know, these different actors and forces that are involved. There's, you know, the victim rights activists and kind of the moral entrepreneurs. There's dominant culture, there's politics. Obviously, you know, there's these ideas we knew as kids and we're told don't talk to strangers, don't take candy from a stranger. This Again, we talked about Halloween before this started up, but, you know, that's why every year the drug panic, you're going to get like laced with something in your 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 candy and somebody's going to abduct you or whatever. Um, every year. It, you know, <laughs> and, you know, other elements of you, you call this kind of the, 
the child safety regime, which includes things like child fingerprinting, which I remember when those folks came to my school. And so, you know, I'm interested in kind of as you wrote this book, like how you tried to think about like how is this stuff flowing? Like it's not a, you know, it's not a top down thing in terms of it all coming from kind of, you know, the mainstream cultural apparatus and politics first at all. They do get very involved in it. Mm -hmm. Um, But there's obviously also this kind of organic phenomenon of these parents that are victims responding to like real and very devastating personal crises, obviously, of losing their children. And we can all like empathize and relate to that. You know, the moral entrepreneurs that we discussed earlier, the news coverage um, and the government, you know, responding, of course, with public policy eventually, which we'll get to that a little bit more later then we have these pop cultural references. So I'm just kind of interested in how you thought about this kind of swirl and interaction and, you know, the kind of development. And uh, I mean, this is this becomes huge, like, you know, to think about something like this showing up in all of these. We're talking about like blockbuster movies and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, it also creates this kind of self-fulfilling kind of culture of fear it's a mm-hmm. self-propelling thing at a certain point so yeah i i it i don't have a clear question but i'm just curious how you grapple with this kind of broad cultural resonance no i think it was a clear question um so you know it's tough to find or pinpoint kind of the the origin of of this sort of thing right because you know, it's it's tough to kind of pinpoint where this comes from, right? Or or the precise origin point. So I, tr- you know, I point to the Aton Pates case, and that's kind of where much of this started. But when it comes to something like the milk carton campaign, it has its origins in a milk carton campaign that didn't even really get off the ground in Iowa. So this actually stemmed from the Iowa Paperboy kidnappings and the Anderson Erickson Dairy in Iowa first started to to put the faces of missing kids, namely Johnny Gosh and Eugene Martin, on uh, its dairy products. And it didn't really get off the ground, but then you had other dairies in, in larger markets, specifically in Chicago, who took notice and started doing this. And this is a very short-lived program. It only lasts a few years, but it's incredibly prodigious. So it produces something like three or five billion of these milk cartons. And then it dies out, but it lives on kind of in in cultural memory. And it's something that people still kind of use as cultural shorthand for, you know, people use it all the time when they're saying, well, you're you know, you're not doing your job if you're a politician or if you're an athlete, a professional athlete, and you're not, you know, living up to the <laughs> expectations of of your contract or whatever, you know, you're missing an action or, you know, you're not actually the sort of closer that we wanted, right? Uh, so, so the fact that it's kind of lived on, I think, speaks to just how resonant the themes at the core of this book and at the core of this panic are. Uh, these themes of kind of childhood innocence of when it comes to the milk carton specifically, this kind of familial gathering dimension, right? So people gathering around the breakfast table and and talking about what's appearing on the milk carton, you know, it kind of serves as this script in a way, right? So if you see a child on a milk carton and you are a child, you begin to believe, okay, I might get kidnapped. And people did believe that. And so there, there's... Uh, There are these statistics that I point to in the book that indicate that a majority of kids or or a plurality of kids are basically saying, yeah, I might get kidnapped or this is a major threat and this is a major fear that I have. And you're right. It doesn't just kind of come from the mainstream cultural apparatus or uh, policymakers. A lot of this is on the grassroots or it's kind of generated, this panic is generated by the bereaved parents who are very much kind of front and center when this issue is discussed in in the news media. So yeah, there's not there's not a there's not a single author, right, of this panic. And I think that that is um, kind of a flaw within maybe some moral panic kind of theory. Which seems to suggest that a lot of this is kind of 
is produced from or produced by a few actors, right? And this kind of percolates and and uh, finds its way into kind of elite policy circles. I think that works. That framework works in certain scenarios, but in in this scenario, it doesn't necessarily because there is actually resistance. And I think we're going to get into this a little bit, but there's resistance from the feds. You know, they don't really want to get involved in this because there are these jurisdictional issues. Uh, it would take tremendous capacity require tremendous capacity to kind of address each one of these cases because as I noted at the at the outset, there are a lot of missing children cases, but a lot of these are benign in nature. Um, so a child is going to Jimmy's house, but their parent thinks that they're going to Timmy's house. And so there's some confusion and they get reported missing. You know, they're maybe missing for an hour, missing, you know, not really missing. But um and there are a lot of Familial kidnappings and, and acquaintance kidnappings. Um, there are very few stranger kidnappings, but that's that's what gets the most coverage, and and that's how people sort of come to fear this issue. But yeah, the short answer is there's no there's no single author, I think, and and a lot of this maybe compares to to what we see today with Moms for Liberty with the anti trans panic. Right, you have multiple sites at which these this panic is operating if we're talking about the kind of book banning anti-trans anti-gay panic uh, which i think is all sort of interwoven and not all that distinct from from q which maybe had its heyday a few years ago i think it's kind of on the wane um i could be wrong about that but you know i think there are very few actors at the grassroots level who are involved in this sort of thing, but a lot of it gets picked up by the media, right? They kind of latch on to battles in places like Iowa or Florida, and this kind of gets a larger audience because of of the news media. And then you have politicians who want to pay lip service to it. In so doing, they're, they're fanning the flames. You know, they might not be the authors, but they do a whole lot to to really kind of perpetuate a lot of this. So it it's difficult to say exactly uh, where this all kind of comes from. But at one point or at some point, it kind of is out of our control, and it's it's kind of spreading like wildfire. And it might dissipate in in some ways, but it it's always present, and there's always an opportunity for it to kind of kick into high gear again. To mix my metaphors, so. That might not be a very satisfying answer, but um, yeah, that's the best I can do. <laughs> yeah, it's. I mean, I think it's right, you know. And I think obviously, I think that the the media obviously plays a really critical role, and you show that throughout. And obviously, that question, all those references are, you know, if we think about the media expansively of as like you know things like Hollywood movies, but also things like nightly news and mm-hmm. you know twenty four hour news cycles and things like that, historians. And this is something that we've been arguing about for a while. Historians of the late 20th century U.S. they don't watch enough television, you know, because this is such an important, you know, source of people's information. It's such an important actor uh, and force in in American life in this moment. And not enough people are kind of going to the Vanderbilt Television News Archive and and looking at these sources because this is where people got their information. This is what kind of drove a lot of policy. So I think, you know, fellow historians, please watch more TV. Yeah. But the local news, those those little syndicated like stories that get, you know, real rolled out of, yeah, cops rollerblading in India or whatever the fuck, you know, like. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, so you alluded to this in the last response, but I did want to talk about it a little bit more because this is very this was a very interesting aspect of this story to me is the kind of. The way that this kind of. Um, it, you know, is in some ways initially resisted by certain political, certain law enforcement forces, the, this kind of reticence to capitulate initially to the, the kind of key ideas animating this stranger danger epidemic, particularly, as you said, from a few figures on the, you know, federal government, DOJ, FBI. I'm going to pull a quote here. So um, you write, quote, the FBI's assistant director of criminal investigations, Oliver B. Ravel, claimed that, 
quote, we are an agency of limited jurisdiction, end quote. The FBI's dilemma, Ravel maintained, quote, is that many children, including young children, are not abducted. They wander off. They are lost. They are taken by relatives. Or there is some other type of situation that occurs that clearly is not within the statute or the mandate of the federal kidnapping statute of 1932, We do not have the capability or the jurisdiction to search for every missing child, end quote. So, you you know, you reference this, you know, granted, you know, this is the FBI primarily saying basically, yeah, it is in our jurisdiction. We don't have the personnel yet. But he's also touching on on realities here. Uh, And this was this is an interesting thing, too, because there's these outlandish statistics that do get debunked and at a certain point, that doesn't matter anymore, as you kind of said, in terms of like the resonance of these things. So eventually, you know, I think because of kind of, as you pointed out, certain political actors getting attached to this Reagan, kind of seeing like how this can fit into his agenda, you know, basically it kind of makes it impossible at a certain point that they law enforcement kind of gets into a situation here where they're like, it's not really real. But we can't be seen as the people who are opposing it because we're being attacked by these people as not taking it seriously. And that makes us look like we're not doing our jobs. Right. Yeah. Um, And so I'm interested if you could talk a little bit about the relationship here between law enforcement, particularly at a federal level, um, but also at the local level, because sometimes there's there's similar dynamics that happen sometimes with local police departments, too, of this, you know, so-called epidemic, you know, not a real Mm -hmm. epidemic in the early Mm -hmm. stages. Um, Because it's not as though initially they all just like opportunistically seize on this idea. They don't they don't all say like, oh, this is a great political move for us to marry with this epidemic idea early on. I mean, it actually takes them a while to figure out how they kind of want to position themselves to this thing. So, yeah, just take it from there. Yeah. So this really plays out at the federal level. And you see that clearly in a lot of policy documents and kind of internal memos where federal officials are saying, what are we going to do about this issue? Because it has tremendous resonance, tremendous appeal, and we don't want to seem callous. But at the same time, there are these logistical problems, these logistical issues with potentially responding to all of these different cases. And yet that's what a lot of people are clamoring for. And that's what a lot of Congress people are kind of hearing from their constituents, right? And There's one particular sort of trope that gets deployed again and again, and that's related to the federal database of kind of missing items and then missing people. And so in a sense, the the argument that that John Walsh and Noreen Gosh and others make is that there is a database, a federal database that highlights all of the missing or stolen items, right? So stolen, uh, usually, you know, big ticket items, uh, boats and cars and and what have you. And there is a database for missing persons, but there's no database for missing children. And so that becomes something that they really hammer home again and again. And they say, you know, what about, what about children? Why are my child, my child is more valuable than a boat or a car, right? So we need this database. And it's something that the Reagan administration kind of responds to, but it's DOJ. So Reagan kind of recognizes the the appeal of this. And in legislation, federal legislation passed in 82 and 84, he and, and Congress are very much kind of seeking to, to address some of these concerns. But federal officials, federal uh, law enforcement officials are, are less gung-ho about it. They recognize the the limits of of their their bureaus or their their departments, and they they kind of acknowledge the very nature of the so called epidemic, as you noted. Meaning, there are a lot of kids who are missing. They're not missing in the ways that people perceive them to be missing, and it's just not practical or necessarily advisable for law enforcement to be intervening in in all these different cases. And yet there is this sort of understanding of optics or this this recognition that if we say that, we're going to look really, really callous. And this is also coming at a moment in which federal law enforcement is kind of 
uh, the butt of the joke in many ways. Um, so you see this in a lot of 80s pop culture texts. Um, you know, we talked a bit about pop culture texts and their use of the milk carton, for instance, but you also have uh, this idea that federal law enforcement is just inept or or bumbling and you need a good guy with a gun, essentially. You know, um, you need Bruce Willis as, what's his name, John McClane in, in Die Hard, right? He's as much kind of opposed to the the terrorists as he is to law enforcement, right? Which seek to kind of curtail him and and prevent him from achieving his goal and, and saving the day. So this idea that the feds just don't want to get involved, they're, they're lazy, they're bureaucrats, that has tremendous purchase among people. And so you see again and again that that trope that I just mentioned being incorporated into these letters that are sent to Congress people. And this is something that, that federal officials kind of feel that they have to respond to. At the same time, they they know their limits. They know that this is not something that they can feasibly do. And some of this plays out also at the local level. Um, there's this myth that all local, and this is something that appears again and again in the rhetoric of, of a lot of these bereaved parents. They say, you know, oh, um, law enforcement at the local level, the state level, have to observe a waiting period before they can before they can investigate missing children. And that's not true, or it wasn't true in most cases. The fact is that a lot of them just kind of did want to wait to determine kind of precisely what the the shape of this a particular case was. Again, that's another thing that shows up in movies all the time. Like of like you know that you, your your kid get you don't know where your kid is, and you go to the police department, and they say, "Oh, ma'am, you can't report this for twenty four hours or whatever," right? Mm-hmm. And it's like, mm-hmm. um, which again is interesting in terms of thinking of kind of all the elements of this panic that make their way into into pop culture and, you know, then take on a life of their own too. So chapter five, this is where we start to get again to kind of now some of the the policy implications and things like that, which are really obviously very important. I found this chapter really interesting. I found all of it interesting, but, you know, this shows kind of how, you know, the state, uh, in this case, the federal government, you know, kind of starts to crystallize a certain trajectory out of these politics, I would say, you know, and I wouldn't suggest that, you know, something as big as, you know, family values, conservatism or neoliberal policy and the carceral turn were all sort of born, you know, in out of this moment. You know, I don't think it's that simple, but certainly there's a moment here in the book where these things start to kind of cohere into a policy agenda with multiple elements kind of becomes an issue where they can tie together a lot of things that they they want to do as as their government and a way to kind of, I don't know. I mean, it's like sort of a, a convenient issue to attach certain carceral, certain neoliberal policies to. And so there's a couple of things that I did want to draw attention to that you highlight. One, which we talked about briefly, is that you talk about the kind of move to deinstitutionalization in the juvenile delinquent prevention act i know i'm missing messing up that acronym but no, something JG, yeah JGD, juvenile, juvenile justice, justice right delinquency yeah. prevention act i there you go. always forget the bear yeah. one and the, the wetterling one so you write that this act right empowered american youth to flee abusive domestic situations without fear of incarceration for reagan conservatives these developments spelled trouble because youth liberation threatened to reconfigure age-based power hierarchies in ways that could sow disorder and tear at the social fabric. Reaganites worked to roll back the accomplishments of the children's rights movement and thus to reconsolidate parental, institutional, and adult authority. The president and his acolytes marshaled the 1980s child safety panic in the service of these policy goals, drawing on public concerns about crime and missing children, Reagan conservatives blurred the boundaries between different classifications of missing youth by conflating missing, runaway, and exploited children. They could obscure the divergent factors that contributed to these various phenomena and pursued misguided policy solutions privileging custodial control, end quote. So this is one thing that I think is is really important. We've kind of touched on it along the way, you know, but there's this other 
there's this other thing going on that on some level might seem like a contradiction if you don't understand racism, right? But um, <laughs> so you write, quote, for Reaganites used perceived to be irredeemable, generally poor, young people of color reared in dysfunctional families. They deserve to be punished through an increasingly harsh juvenile justice apparatus. These ideas fed off and fed into a larger discourse concerning the urban, quote unquote, underclass by pathologizing poor and working class Americans, particularly young black and brown people, conservative and neoliberal thinkers could portray poverty, unemployment, drug use, low educational attainment and criminality as individual failings rather than products of structural inequality, end quote. So I know those are lengthy quotes, but I really wanted to pull out those sections because I think that, that there's some really good work going on in those passages. And you go into to more detail on this in the chapter, but if you could just talk a little bit about how this fits with the stranger danger um, panic, because now we're moving towards a phase where the government is kind of taking control of these narratives and really driving them towards specific neoliberal or conservative policy outcomes. And I also think it's important because we're, you know, we're very familiar with this agenda. You know, we, we know this agenda, but I think it really helps us see kind of where it congeals, you know, in policy, I guess. Yeah. So Reagan uses this in a multitude of different ways. So, um, and this is not something that I want to kind of assign solely to Reagan. It's in keeping with a broader sort of, you might want to call it a kind of a neoliberal approach to governance and, and poverty governance and children's rights in this moment. But essentially what develops are two tracks of policy for runaway youth, and for juvenile youth or for delinquents, right? So there's a distinction that policymakers within the Reagan administration are, first of all, they're trying to, and this is done through the appointment of, um, what's his name? Alfred Regnery, who is a really interesting figure. And he is the son of uh, a publishing magnet, a uh, conservative publishing magnet. And he very much kind of his political education was forged through Young Americans for Freedom. And so he's he's a, a believer. And so he wants to essentially destroy the OJJDP, which is the agency created by the JJDP. So it's the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. And he views it as, he calls it a social agency. And views it as kind of a product of, of great society liberalism, which is true to an extent, right? It does kind of bear some of those hallmarks, but he opposes the mission altogether. He thinks that the idea of kind of prevention of juvenile delinquency is uh, ridiculous, right? So basically some youth need to be brought to heel, to use Hillary Clinton's phrase, the idea that you can kind of prevent juvenile delinquency through various supports whether it's kind of uh, you know funds, you know recreational activities, those sorts of things, he thinks that's ridiculous. They're just bad kids, and they're good kids. And bad kids tend to be, in his view, you know, black and brown. And he says this explicitly. He says, you know, the typical juvenile delinquent is black or Latino, and they're they're young, and they have they're remorseless basically. And so you see kind of the the ways in which the super predator sort of trope begins to form in a lot of his rhetoric. So his response, if he's going to, you know, because his a attempt to destroy the OJJDP is actually thwarted by Congress. Basically, Congress is saying, what are you talking about? You know, we actually need this agency. Uh, so you're, you're not really going to, you're not going to succeed in this, in this way. So he decides, okay, I am actually going to use this for various policy ends, right? And so the one is kind of rendering the juvenile justice system. I think he he says in his phrase, you know, it needs to have teeth, right? It needs to it needs to be more punitive. And so his goal is to to do that. And with the other sort of track, he has in mind this kind of white runaway. That's the the sort of trope or the uh, the archetype that he has in mind as he's crafting policy with this other track. He views these youth not as bad necessarily. They're just kind of wayward. And 
they do need to be kind of institutionalized in some way. So there's a movement away, as you said, from deinstitutionalization, which is core to the mission of the JJDP Act. There's this, again, recognition of children's rights, of their agency, their their ability to kind of flee certain domestic situations. So he is moving away from that a bit, but there's still a recognition that, okay, we need to to provide support and we need to ensure that these children are not being exploited, right? There's none of that in the other track where he's saying, no, these kids, they are the predators. They are the the ones who are doing the exploiting. These other kids, they're mostly innocent. They might have you know, gone astray in some way, but we need to protect them from basically predators, you know, folks who are, who are preying on them. And that plays out in a, a lot of different policy that they're pursuing uh, under the auspices of the OJJDP. And I argue it sets the foundation or, or helps enable this explosion in, in the juvenile justice system and this kind of hardening of the juvenile justice system and um, – also helps lay the foundation for, you know, we talked about how the federal law enforcement apparatus was reticent to intervene on this issue. It enables them to become a bit more assertive. And the DOJ is now, you know, very, very willing to intervene when it comes to sex offenses and and offenses involving children. And some of this can be kind of traced back to uh, what Regnery was doing and to this panic, right? Uh, which is, again, sort of intertwined with the anti-pornography panic of the moment. And so on these sorts of issues, federal law enforcement and kind of adjacent agencies and, and entities are are increasingly willing to, to intervene. Yeah. Those conservatives who told me that they just want everybody to me- be measured by the same yardstick really were lying to me this whole time. Like... <laughs> um, so I want to, you know, talk a little bit about this in the Clinton era. Um, it continues to be a key issue. It animates multiple aspects of the 94 crime bill, as well as some subsequent Clinton era legislation. You talk, you know, in this chapter about the Wetterling Act, which we referenced a little bit earlier, mm-hmm. um, the expansion of sex offender registries, which really take off in this period, and the connection of stranger danger concerns to three strikes laws, which is very explicit, but I had kind of forgotten that or brain dumped it or whatever, as well as, um, you know, Megan's law, which is kind of a a key sort of pivotal moment of carceral feminism, I guess, or something Mm -hmm. along those lines. And so Mm -hmm. if you could say a little bit about, you know, these stranger danger politics in the Clinton era. Uh, And also, I should say, there's also a connection here with welfare policy as well, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So Clinton, as Greg Grandin put it, is Reagan's greatest achievement. And a lot of historians have talked about his policy making as a response to Reaganism. But I think if you kind of look back throughout his career, um, he was always kind of anti-labor. He was hostile to certain segments of of uh, leftist movements. So I don't think that this is all that surprising. And even within the 92 campaign, you know, he's demonstrating that he's going to be tough on crime. And so to suggest that, as some people have, that a lot of his kind of landmark policy achievements were, you know, sops to the right or, um, you know, he was kind of hemmed in and had to make these these sorts of concessions, I think, is is uh, incorrect. But what happens in in eighty nine in Minnesota is Jacob Wetterling gets kidnapped, sexually assaulted, and murdered, and that case doesn't get resolved until twenty sixteen. But nevertheless, his his name, his face, become the the inspiration for this sex offense registration act that is tucked into the crime bill. And of course, much ink has been spilled on the crime bill, which, you know, expanded the number of of law enforcement in the United States and sought to make specifically the federal judicial system a bit more punitive. And I can get to three strikes in a second and how, you know, it played out on the state level and the federal level are kind of different. But I think 
The Wetterling Act often gets overlooked, and I think it kind of speaks to people's discomfort with talking about sex offenses as a kind of major driver or the uh, prosecution of sex offenses as a major driver of mass incarceration. And this kind of surveillance state that is this punitive surveillance state that is kind of attached to the carceral state. And that manifests itself in in sex offense registries most clearly, which people are very, very hesitant to talk about. But the sheer kind of scale, I think, is is really kind of daunting. You know, so I think something like one million people are now registered as sex offenders in the United States. And a lot of this is predicated, as I talk about in the book, on the stranger danger myth because Jacob Wetterling was kidnapped and and sexually assaulted and killed by a stranger, he becomes kind of the face of of this problem or this perceived problem. And, and sexual abuse, of course, is a major issue in, in American society, but it's not reflected in Jacob Wetterling's case or this this idea of the the nefarious stranger kind of jumping out of the bushes and then assaulting someone. It's it's more insidious. So the Wetterling Act is a key component of the crime bill, and so too is the Three Strikes Law, which is passed in large part because of the, the Poly Class case in California, which took place in 93, I believe, and also kind of reflects stranger danger fears. This was a, a young girl who was at her home during a sleepover and was snatched from her home and later killed. And the three strikes law is passed in California and on the federal level and then passed in in various states, quite a few states. It isn't the the major driver of mass incarceration that a lot of people think it is. It is on the state level in in certain states. So in California it it has a, a big effect. On the federal level, you know, it, I forget who said this. I think it was maybe Alex Vitale, but he says if it's kind of tough to get sent to federal prison. You have to, you know, either be involved in kind of some sort of firearms offense or or drug offense or some sort of financial crime. And so it isn't the major driver of of mass incarceration. And as you know, most people who are incarcerated in the US are not incarcerated in federal prisons. This is mostly a local and state issue. But what is important is this is further kind of perpetuating the stranger danger myth and the the kind of logic of the exogenous threat. And in so doing it, it's stoking the anti-crime panic. And just to kind of go back a second, the Wetterling Act, I think, is the more important component here because it is a clear illustration of the federal government intervening on this issue and essentially saying, OK, this is a major problem. All of you states, every single state has to adopt and maintain a sex offense registry. And this is a precursor to a national sex offense registry, which you can visit. It's a, a government-sponsored website. The, the DOJ sponsors it. And you know the the sheer scale of this, again, is is – is something I can't overstate and something that I think a lot of people who are interested in mass incarceration and interested in in ending mass incarceration is something that they have to grapple with because it's you know there is this obsession I think with innocence not just in what I'm talking about here meaning you know these these cases but also this obsession with innocence when it comes to folks on the left who are interested in decarceration in ending mass incarceration there are people on sex offense registry and in jails and prisons who have done terrible things, but that shouldn't stop people from reexamining how we address these issues or how we prevent harm from taking place in the first place, because that's ultimately the goal. And the truth of the matter is that the criminal legal system is only interested, for the most part, in addressing harm after it's already been committed, right? So, you know, how do we fold in folks who are, some would say, kind of subject to social death, so marginalized and oftentimes excluded from any sort of criminal justice reform. You know, how do we fold those folks in while also recognizing the harm that's been committed and and seeking to to find justice for for all parties involved? What the sex offense registry does is it 
gives people a false sense of security and it places the threat of sexual violence outside of the actual spaces in which it most often occurs. So it's the the family home, it's the the trusted institution, right, in which these sorts of harms are committed. And that's such an uncomfortable truth that people have convinced themselves that this is the best way, that is the registry, that's the best way to address sexual violence when there's a lot of evidence to suggest that it's it's actually not and and perhaps it's counterproductive by by kind of placing it in the outside of the actual kind of sites where where this sort of thing uh, tends to occur. So it's something that people need to focus on and need to to talk about more honestly. And I think as one of your questions suggests, you know, it's really hard to do for fear of of being labeled kind of a sympathizer for those who perpetrate sexual harm. It's it's actually quite the opposite. And yeah, you mentioned Vicky Law. Uh, Aya Gruber and others, and Mariam Kaba, of course, who have talked about how how preventing harm is so essential, and it's it's not going to be achieved through these mechanisms that we have in place. In fact, those mechanisms are actually exacerbating the problem. Yeah. Well, there's a couple of things I do want to touch on quickly before we let you go. So we've talked about the child safety regime. Maybe say if there's certain things that we we haven't really discussed or or highlighted or just, you know, list off kind of some of the things that fall into this category as you're thinking about this idea of the child safety regime. And I guess the important question about it is, you know, what does it have to show for itself? A lot, but not a lot of good stuff. So the regime, as I've kind of conceptualized it, is is really expansive. So it's not just the the pop culture texts that you've mentioned or or the news media insistence on, you know, identifying uh, strangers as this major threat on Halloween, but it also has to do with just the the sorts of practices, the common sense practices that a lot of parents and guardians and community members kind of participate in and kind of perpetuate. So yeah, the very idea that you can't let your child walk to the playground if it's a few blocks away or what have you, because that child is going to get snatched by a stranger. I mean, that's such a firmly entrenched idea. And it, again, kind of obscures the actual threats that that face children. You know, I'm a, an avid cyclist. I cycle to the campus uh, every day on which I teach. And the roads are so dangerous and and being a pedestrian being a cyclist so dangerous and that's not the fear that people have right when they're when they're talking about oh i don't i don't let my child roam free so but that that logic even among people who kind of know and that kind of ties back to what you were talking about concerning the fact that these statistics have been debunked again and again it doesn't matter right people have absorbed this and they're the panic is within them, right? The the they know. Okay, this is not logical, but part of me thinks that I need to prevent my child from being abducted, or you know, prevent them from a threat that is not nearly as grave and as expansive as as a lot of people think, or, or people used to think. So, you know, that's that's a big part of it. I think, yeah, the sex offense registry, this this uh this obsession with the the sexual predator, um, the stranger rather than the the sexual predator, if you want to use that language, kind of within the romanticized household or, you know, in in the robe, in the cloth, you know, th- that I think is it's such a kind of cultural legacy of of this moment and and something that we haven't fully grappled with but yeah the regime is all around us i mean whether whether you look at uh, the amber alerts that kind of rattle your phone all the time or the the code adam little stickers in um, retail spaces which is an homage to adam walsh and also kind of sets this protocol establishes this protocol by which service workers, retail workers, have to abide if in the in the instance of a of a missing child, and that 
that's really rare, right? That that's employed. But the fact that it's it's there, you know, every time I go to Whole Foods, I hate that I go to Whole Foods, but I, I do. Um, you know, there's that little sticker, and I I think you know more people should read Stranger Danger. And there are many many different ways in which this kind of manifests, or there are reminders all around us, right? Yeah, absolutely. Is there anything else you would like to say just kind of about, you know, these threats? You know, as I understand your work, you're basically part of the the key argument is that stranger danger is actually the greater threat. Like the 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 child safety regime is the greater threat. This kind of ideology, I guess, of stranger danger. You know, what are your thoughts on you know, kind of responses to this. I mean, obviously you've written, I know that's not really the point of, of writing this book that, you know, you, you write this book to illustrate this big problem and kind of contextualize it, situate it. Um, but I, you know, I'm interested in kind of any thoughts you have on, on starting to respond and kind of like ways to push back, you know? Yeah, it's really hard, especially since so much of this kind of is sort of entrenched in the built environment. I mean, we've built cities, spaces that are so difficult to traverse, for, you know, for children to to play in. I mean, these are hostile spaces, not just because, you know, <laughs> you'll go outside and get hit by a car, but also because, you know, if you're in a car all day, if you're commuting to work, you know, I'm as I said, I'm from Houston, Texas. This is kind of ground zero for this. You're so alienated from people around you. If you just drive into your garage, drive out of your garage and into your garage all day, you may not even say hi to your neighbors. That's going to make you more suspicious of of your neighbors, of people in the community. If if we've hollowed out our social infrastructure as much as we have, and people retreat to, you know, I'm not saying social media is all bad, but retreat to certain kind of social media circles and and get their information that way that's that's only going to make them more suspicious um especially if they're consuming certain media and they're going to be more inclined to believe that yeah Hillary Clinton is going to abduct your child and suck their blood or whatever adrenochrome is that it so that's going to become more plausible right so i think you know one way to push back is just to recognize that this is not the threat that people think it is and to build a world that's safer for children in all these different ways. So yeah, better schools, safer environments in which to play, an actual healthy sort of education that tells them if they're being abused in a in any way, that there are resources at their disposal, right? And and that they they shouldn't be fearful of speaking out. And I think that that larger kind of cultural culture of silence is something that can go a long way to actually rectifying this issue. You know, speaking honestly about the nature of sexual harm, it's it's something that a lot of children deal with. And it's something that does not come from, for the most part, the sites, the places where a lot of folks want it to come from, essentially, because that is a more comforting myth. It's a it's more comforting. It's less comfortable to say, actually, the very institution that we have held up as all that is good and right and as the antidote to all of our social problems, it's actually the incubator of a lot of our social problems. So, you know, grappling with that and then grappling with the ways in which the family has kind of structured our built environment and prevented people from you know, being more enmeshed in their communities and and less fearful of of urban spaces, of spaces where people congregate. I think you know, just acknowledging that, trying to find ways to build community, I think is going to go a long way. And yeah, just being being more honest about the threats that face children, the threats that do not face children, and I think giving children more agency. They are so. I mean, they're obviously little, but they're so infantilized, right? And there is this within this parents' rights movement that's ascendant right now, there is this idea of children as possessions, as property. And that is so, so dangerous to you know just acknowledge that that's kind of the at the crux of the parents' rights movement or moms for liberty or what have you. I think that'll go a long way. And 
I think another thing is in a lot of liberal circles, there's a lack of recognition that they are contributing to the problem by by spotlighting Moms for Liberty or by stoking an anti-trans panic or an anti-gay panic. You know, that The Atlantic, The New York Times, they are helping to perpetuate this this problem and they're they're endangering the lives of, of children. And so if you actually care about the lives of children, you know, trans kids, uh, vulnerable children, then this is something that you would re-examine. But, you know, the anti-trans thing is very much animating those those mainstream media outlets. And so I think every every opportunity that people on the left have to push against that, I think they should. Yeah, absolutely. Paul Renfro, thank you so much for this conversation and this book. Is there anything else you, you wanted to share with folks before I let you go? No, I just want to say thank you so much for having me on. It was, it was a blast. All right. This was great. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.